Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes video. Uh, in this video, we are going to be taking a look at the elevator and the cave for the Orc display board. But before we go there, I just wanted to welcome all of the new uh, viewers and potentially subscribers who've dropped into this video. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. And if you are curious about this project and where it has been, come from, then you should go back and see my playlists in my YouTube channel. And I discovered four videos that weren't in the playlist when I was uh, getting ready to shoot these videos. So I've found them and put them into the playlist. So now there's 21 videos, I think, that led up to this point. I actually have one that's still 22. I haven't edited one. So please uh, make sure you go and check those out if you have questions uh, about some of the things that I'm going to show you. But before we get into um, taking a look at that, of course, I need to introduce the cocktail of the evening uh, or day. Uh, it's, you know, it's not that early in the day, but it's always cocktail time somewhere in the world. So, you know, uh, today's cocktail is a rusty nail. Uh, this is a combination of scotch and drambuie. And uh, I finally got some drambuie into my cabinet, um, not in the too distant past, uh, and um, really had no idea what it, you know, what it was like. But I see it in recipes and I'm like, well, better add it. It's pretty good. I like it. The Jambui is um, kind of a uh, honey-infused uh, scotch with some herbs and other things uh, added to it. Recipe that I saw said to um, pour the scotch over the ice and then pour the Jambui over that. It's not uh, shaken or mixed, so I don't know. It's all right. I like it, actually. I like it. The Jambui adds a little bit of sweetness to the scotch, but you don't lose the scotch on its own. Also, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Maybe, maybe not using um, crystal clear ice, except for this piece, which has an imperfection in it, which is its own story, which I won't tell you. Um, but to make, I love clear ice in my drinks, like clear ice. And uh, it's been a little while since I started making it again. It makes your drinks look so sexy. It really does. Uh, and you can cut your cubes to whatever size you want. So you can have, you know, a couple big chunks in there rather than, you know, a bunch of small cubes. And you're going to ask me, clear ice, what is that? How do you make it? The trick to making clear ice is um, what they, what I call, maybe it's called, uh, directional freezing. So you take a pot and you um, insulate the pot. I used uh, bubble wrap and air pack and whatnot. And you make a, an insulation shroud around it so that it can only freeze from the top down. Put that in the freezer and then as it freezes, all of the water that freezes will be crystal clear. You have to pull it out before it freezes to the bottom, which is why I have a couple of bubbles in here. At the bottom is where all of the um, dissolved minerals and impurities are because ice will try to form a perfect lattice that is free of all of those kinds of impurities, as well as when it freezes at the last spot available in a normal... I wasn't going to explain all of this. In a normal ice cube, right, we're freezing it from all the sides towards the middle. Now, when the middle freezes, it, there's not enough space for it because ice expands. So it fr expands and it fractures the ice and you get all those patterns of fractures within your ice. That's why it's not crystal clear. So by doing it this way and pulling your ice out before, you know, about halfway in the pot, you know, I get a layer about yay thick out of it. Then um, it's just crystal clear is beautiful. It makes your drink look so sexy. I don't know if you can really see it. It's from above. It's just a thing of beauty. Maybe some point I'll take a photo of it. And uh, then I use a bread knife to cut the ice. I know that sounds weird. I've tried other methods. I have an ice pick. Uh, I, I nice, you know, chisel. I can't get it to, to fracture easily, but you just keep cutting with that bread knife. You'll see cracks start to form when you cleave it. You know, they're not, they're irregular shaped but uh, that adds to its charm. Just wonderful. And I could go on more about my ice, which is, I think that must be telling, right? That I'm as neurotic about my ice as I am about my terrain. But nevertheless, we move forward. So I have a notable mention at the end of this video, so hopefully you'll stick around for that. And let's take a look at the elevator and the cave. Uh, I like to think that at this stage in the video sum summary of the project, we're starting to get to the really exciting bit. So hopefully you find it as interesting as uh, I do.
So here you see the uh, the elevator and the cart and the winches. The tension came out really, really well. The, um, the rope is supple enough, more so than the first rope I was going to use, that it really um, uh, accepts tension well with a smaller amount of weight. And so I was glad that I didn't have to fill the cart any more than I did. Elevator and its other components, the winches and the uh, lifting platform, that's what I call it. And this platform uh, for the elevator, I added in some bits. Uh, the boxes are uh, cobbled together from some shields. And I really uh, felt like it came together well. More cargo would have been nice, but um, it was about what I could fit. And the photo doesn't show the uh, ramp and the included stairs at the front of the elevator platform at the top. Uh, and uh, I just forgot to include them for the photo. But the stairs are included because when the elevator reaches the top, the length of the, the blocks prevents it from coming to the platform itself. So the stairs allow riders of the platform to uh, exit the cart more easily. And here's a shot of the uh, winch in the back, uh, give you a sense of how it all ties together. The ropes I used from Siren uh, Ship Modeling, and I dirtied them with pan pastels, and they really helped take a little bit of the shine off of them. And give. Them and this close-up of Knotlings shows uh, that I was able to coil some ropes behind them, and that helped to actually take up some of the length of the total rope uh, because the rope is scaled uh, appropriately for the block and tackle system. So there was a little bit of extra I needed to accommodate. And here we see the ratchet for the winches. This was added uh, actually quite late in the process based on a suggestion from a viewer. And it was uh, needed really to uh, somehow prevent the winches from unrolling. So it's not entirely workable per se, uh, but um, I felt glad about adding it. And here we get a sense of the uh, second winch. This is the one closest to the front of the board uh, and a view of, again, the uh, ratchet system. Not extremely happy about the rust effects. I used model mates for that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it now, but uh, mm, I'm not, not entirely happy with them. Uh, but I love that snotling there holding that rolling, and I was really glad to include him. And here you see a top view of the cart's contents and the arrangement of these pieces actually took me quite a while because of the cow tail <laughs> not entirely but quite 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 a fair amount uh, because the cow is not uh, slumped the way you would normally expect it to be if it was dead i had to find a way to support the cow tail and that pouch uh that was right under it actually worked out fairly well and I just wanted to give you a quick uh, demonstration of breaking it down so that the client particularly, uh, but also, um, you know, ideas for all of you on how to uh, disassemble something and on maybe how you can see creating uh, difficult elements uh, that can be removed uh, into sections that might make it easier for storage or for transport. But before I do the disassembly, I do want to point out something. And I think you'll be able to see it at this camera angle. The pin that's holding this back leg sticking up just a little bit. This is actually a product of the tension in the rope. It's it the the pulling forward is pulling that up just a little bit. And I did quite a bit of adjustment. It's true for both of these back pieces. Um, these are fairly deep rod that it would be deep enough to to hold it in place and it's just lifting just a little bit so i'm willing to uh you know accept that and, and move on from it uh, but in any case let me show you how it all comes apart so so first thing is cart and now that can be stored uh, separately and then as I mentioned uh, the uh, tension here is uh, created by the actual spring of this arm this arm has a little flexing in it and that was just perfect to hold this string taut uh, but then you can just flex it just a little bit and you can remove that and you can remove the elevator uh, for storage and it just pulls out of some receptacles that I installed in the foam uh, using a styrene tube and then the elevator can be stored separately. So uh, that is how it comes apart and uh, this 
um, then can just be, you know, folded in front of the winches. And because everything is glued in place, um, none of the ropes are going to, you know, uh, lose their position or become tangled. So this is the cave. And uh, taking a look at it, I wanted to show you a perspective from the table, if you will, if you were walking up to the table to view it and give you a sense of what the lighting looks like uh, because the UV lights and you can see some of the effects in here are you know, pretty diminished when it's lit externally, you know, like in a brightly lit room. And this is pretty brightly lit. So it gives you at least a perspective of what that's gonna look like in this environment as I, uh, I really can't crank up the UV well now especially but i mean when i was putting it together and as it is i have it lit with quite a few very bright bulbs and here you can see uh the rock casts that surround the cave uh, the entire cliff and the rock casts are resin casts from mold and wrapping the resin cast around the entrance and you can see that top corner there uh produce some rounding effects of the rock that weren't really perfect and i think to get a better effect I would have needed to cut the uh, cast into pieces and stitch those around the corners a little bit more naturally, but uh, that would have been a considerable amount of work uh, based on the size of the cave and, and trying to get all those corners in uh, just right. And this is a model's eye view coming into the cave, and I think uh, even without the UV lights on, uh, that still provides a pretty interesting invite to the eye. Uh, the mushrooms certainly help pull you in, and this gives you a chance to see them uh, and some normal lighting. And this gives you a look at the interior of the cave. This is slightly overexposed to help emphasize the detail, but it gives you a nice sense of the cave texture and the spiders and the webs and the the mushrooms that are adorned across the uh, floor. Now, some people are going to ask me why I didn't add more rubble to the floor or make it a little bit more uneven. And that really relates to the difficulty I had in assembling the cave and painting it. So the if you go back in my videos, you'll see uh, some of the painting work that I did and how I had to invert the cave to do that painting. And when I, and I had the, the palace uh, attached to the cave walls when I flipped it over to sit it on the floor and melding that out further would be uh, wouldn't have been really easily possible and uh, because of the difficulty of trying to add bits to the floor and not have things all in even I decided to just uh, let the floor go as a clean element and uh, save myself some sanity really in the end as the in cave assembly in general and painting it was uh, pretty difficult as it stands. And here we see a close-up of one of the spiders and the spiders were painted using Createx fluorescent paint uh, which is uh, I thought a very nice paint comes in a, a several colors, but the paint has a rather thin opacity. So I had to put several coats on uh, each of the spots on the spiders. And I mainly just picked out the joints of the legs and the eyes of the spiders. Uh, and because the bodies are quite dark and don't really fluoresce very well, I really wanted to pick out and brighten up some spots of them pretty hotly if you if you might say and it ended up making them not look exactly like the rest of the spiders on the board if you view them in normal light but it was the compromise i was willing to make to make sure that you could see them in the cave and we'll see in a future shot here that uh, they are a little dark uh, compared to the rest of the elements in the cave which are quite bright and this gives you a shot of the webbing as well as the mushrooms. The mushrooms were created by using Super Sculpey, and I got this idea from a video uh, showing how to make Super Sculpey mushrooms at a much larger scale. But the stems and the caps were molded separately, and then they were attached after baking using a uh, Sculpey bacon bond and then baked again. And I could have used super glue to make the join, but I wanted to try out the bacon bond. I'd like to explore using Sculpey more for different elements. And these were a very easy first, you know, kind of sculpt, uh, you know, compared to 
sculpting the idol, that is. Uh, but, um, you know, they're not very hard to make for those of you who are interested in making your own mushrooms. But I will say uh, the Super Sculpey at these kinds of thin pieces uh, is pretty fragile. And I actually broke a couple of the mushrooms during their insertion into the cave. Uh, but because I'm tucking the joints behind rocks and things like that, I was able to just pick up a mushroom and stick it back in again. And I found it a bit of a challenge to uh, space the mushrooms and, and place them. I wanted them in clumps to give it a little bit more of a, this is a patch of soil and they're, they're springing out from it. But without including too many mushrooms, it was a little bit of, I don't know, it was a, a puzzle and, and kind of a, an interesting task to use my eye to see like, I don't know, how do these imaginary mushrooms grow? And I had actually a very nice uh, tip from one of my patrons. I posted an early uh, work in progress on this showing the original distribution of mushrooms. And he made an excellent suggestion that I had too many, which I had suspected on my own. And so I ended up going in and removing probably about 40% of the total number of mushrooms, leaving the amount that you've been seeing in this video. There again, one of the advantages of the Sculpey in a side tangent way was um, I could just kind of pop them out of the uh, spots and if the stem broke it wasn't a really big deal. I ended up uh, however mounting them into the rock using hot glue and so that made a kind of easy way to just tack them in place nice and quick rather than waiting for you know CA or PBA to set up. And for the webbing I actually, again, I got another great tip from one of my patrons about how sometimes movie makers will make webs using hot glue and they will blow a stream of air across it to uh, create uh, thin strands that fly out and then collect on things to make up uh, sort of proxy spider webs. So I actually did that for the cave. A lot of practice. It took a lot of hot glue. I uh, sprayed the glue, so to speak, onto parchment paper. And the webbing itself is more, dur more durable, <laughs> more durable than I expected or even hoped for because the hot glue gives it a little bit of a stretchy effect. And so that made it a little bit more forgiving. However, the installation in the cave was exceptionally difficult as I wanted to have as many contact points as I could because the web uh, it has that irregular pattern and I was using uh, super glue to uh, CA to tack it into place. One quick tip is to use a little bit of uh, wax. I used a little bowling paste wax on the end of my stick and then I could push onto areas and not have the stick get attached uh, to the wall or to the web and that helped a lot. Also I was worried about how I was going to paint the webs and I expected I'd have to paint them in some color but white does not fluoresce. White paint does not fluoresce which surprised me a little actually. So uh, when I was putting it in as a test piece I had painted half of it and I was looking and I realized that the hot glue itself fluoresces naturally. Ah, that was a really big bonus that I didn't expect and was so grateful for. So the webs give a really nice uh, bright effect and that's all straight up from the properties of the hot glue. Uh, so um, if you're interested in seeing uh, more about this process, of course, um, I do have a, an article on Patreon that discusses how I made these as well as a mini video that shows uh, the process of me actually trying to get this effect. And this gives you uh, a little bit better of a natural exposure for the cave as you look into it and uh, assuming that the lights are off. And the uh, spiders are a bit more subdued as you can see here. So that was one of the reasons why I really was trying to brighten them. And in the end, I think they become an, a little bit of an Easter egg. Uh, you have to look closely. And once you start to see one, you'll start to see a whole bunch of them. Hopefully you enjoyed taking a look at the uh, elevator and the cave. Um, I'm pretty pleased with how they came out. Notable mention. Whoops. This is viewer comment. We're not doing that yet. We're doing view notable mentions.
Kathy Millett, um, who has a terrain channel. If you're not familiar with it, you should check it out. A lot of, a lot of really good information there uh, and a wonderful personality delivering it. Uh, she had a video she posted recently that was for uh, demonstrating a uh, very small static grass applicator. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, only about this big in diameter, about that big long. Uh, with a separate power supply it's designed to get into small areas but i could see applications for it in other places because sometimes i just want a little more right there instead of blasting a whole area and i think her demonstration of it uh, sparked a lot of ideas for me so i recommend going out and checking out that video uh, now viewer comments uh, just one today um, and this is from about two months back so uh, sorry joe so joe is commenting on my video laying the foundation for better rock painting and this is a video where i showed my use of gesso and um, applying a wash of tempera uh, to um, shade the face of the cliffs for future painting he uh, asked me uh, for this project, so it's in the playlist. Uh, so, you know, there's the back finger. Go back and take a look at it uh, because, and take a look at the video right after it in the playlist as well when I painted the cliffs, which I think is right after it. So, Joe is putting um, gesso over foam carved rocks. He went to the Bragdon site and he took a look at that, um, and that's all in that info, uh, in that video. And the Bragdon technique, that's what I call it, uses dry tempera paint uh, black in this case so any tempera is going to work it's just black tempera and then the bragdon method is to brush on the dry powder onto the rock surface before you apply your future weathering paints and, and washes i found that to be very very dirty and very uh, messy and time consuming and the viewer clued me in to and was saying that um, i should just do a wash and so i am Using that method which you saw on that previous video and I think it's a better way to apply it I could say a lot about the Bragdon painting technique especially if you don't know what I'm talking about uh, so you might want to go back and see those uh, uh, videos where I do um, go over a little bit more and then I have um, a review of Bragdon molds in my review playlist so there's a lot of, of, of stuff in the back catalog about it but you go to my patreon page and I have a monthly column that is uh, publicly viewable, it's accessible to everybody, and it is called um, Painting Rocks the Bragdon Style. And it's a little bit older, so there's a playlist, a playlist, a, a tag list that will get you to the monthly columns. I think it's one of my featured tags uh, right when you go to the page. And that will get you to that article, and I discuss the method in some measure of depth, as well as how I have changed it uh, to make it work for me better. It's a pretty comprehensive. My monthly columns are detail rich, as you know me. My God, I can't, I, I don't even want sh shit in my eyes. And so I think if you're curious about this style of painting and you're, you're wondering what is this all about, that's probably a good place to start. And of course, if you uh, want to become a patron, that's a way to get access to future monthly columns uh, because these are going to be patron only going forward, although there's like over 30 of them that are publicly viewable. So and a lot of good basics, I think. I don't know. I wrote them, so I'm kind of biased. And I just want to say to my patrons that um, I am behind on my monthly columns and Everybody, I think, has been really patient with me, and I appreciate that. And as soon as I am done with these videos and the board ships, which is hopefully we should be done with the videos by the end of this evening. We'll see, you know, a few cocktails involved in that one. And then I'll be stepping back and taking a few uh, days off and trying to catch up on those. As there's plenty to do, and I'm plenty behind, and I'll be asking my patrons for topics. That wraps it up for this taking a look at the Orc Display Board. Uh, but I am shooting more videos tonight and hopefully you will be coming back for those videos because you know that i will be back soon with another terrence gates video